years, Nagme Panahi heroically advocated for the release of her husband, Iranian-American pastor Saeed Abedini, from an Iranian prison. Yet months before his release, Nagme revealed a dark secret, that for years Saeed had been physically, emotionally, and sexually abusing her. Yet rather than rallying to support this battered wife, Nagme says the Christian community abandoned her. And some, including Franklin Graham and Jay Sekulow, even pressured her to deny the abuse. Welcome to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Roy's. And today I continue my interview with Nagme Panahi. And in this podcast, I'll be sharing emails from Franklin Graham showing how Nagme was treated. I'll also be playing exclusive audio from a meeting Nagme had with Franklin Graham in 2016. And as you'll hear, despite Nagme's insistence that she doesn't feel safe with Saeed, Graham repeatedly pressures her to come to North Carolina and submit to face-to-face counseling with Saeed. You'll also hear part of a convocation at Liberty University where Saeed is praised as a hero of the faith. This convocation happened several months after Nagme went public about Saeed's abuse. The entire story is incredibly sobering, but it's also necessary to bring to light how battered women are treated in the church. But before we hear the rest of Nagme's story, I want to take a minute to thank the sponsors of this podcast, Judson University and Marquardt of Barrington. Judson University is a top-ranked Christian university providing a caring community and an excellent college experience. Plus, the school offers more than 60 majors, great leadership opportunities, and strong financial aid. Judson University is shaping lives that shape the world. For more information, just go to judsonu.edu. Also, if you're looking for a quality new or used car, I highly recommend my friends at Marquardt of Barrington. Marquardt is a Buick GMC dealership where you can expect honesty, integrity, and transparency. That's because the owners there, Dan and Kurt Marquardt, are men of character. To check them out, just go to buyacar123.com. We now pick up my interview with Nagme Panahi, where she describes landing in Boise, Idaho in 2015, just hours after sending an email to supporters telling them about Saeed's abuse. Then, several high-profile Christian leaders called her. The first was Franklin Graham. When Franklin called, what was the content of that conversation? Franklin said, I just, we, I realized you'd sent this email, uh, like I'm shocked. And I start crying, pouring out my heart. Someone just coming out of abuse or understanding abuse, they babble. They're like, well, I just was like talking all over the place, crying, pouring out my heart. And there was silence. And he said, knock me. Can I ask you a question? I said, yes, Franklin, he'd become such a good friend to me. And he said, are you cheating on Saeed? And at that time, I felt like this bleeding woman on the side of the road and this big stone being thrown, the first stone of adulteress. Mm. And I just didn't know what to say. I was like uh, saying all of this, that I've been abused, that I've been physically, that I've been cheated on, that all of this. And your comment is, are you cheating on Saeed? It, It just, it boggled my mind. Later, I realized when other people started accusing me of adultery and trying to be famous, and I realized they had to reconcile. Um, say, they, they had to say, well, why is Nakme saying all this? Oh, it must be that she's with someone else and she's trying to throw Saeed under the bus. So that really shook me. I just remember just being confused and hanging up and I saying no. And later I sent him an email saying, and I have that email saying, Franklin, I am really sad that that's what you said on the phone. And, uh, and then the phone call after that was Dr. Wood, because I remember telling Dr. Wood, like, can you please explain what you're telling me on the phone to Franklin Graham? Hmm. Again, George Wood is superintendent of the Assemblies of God. He also was kind of Saeed's pastor, right? So Saeed comes from the uh, denomination of Assemblies of God. That's the church I met him in, in Iran. He, they knew the pastors, the Iranian pastors overseeing Saeed had put him under church discipline at one point. It's, it's, it's confusing because the pastor that had put him under church discipline had left. And when I met Saeed, he had kind of, because of the pastor leaving, I didn't know Saeed had been under church discipline, that there was the pastor that had left had considered Saeed to be a danger to the body. So when I met him, none of that was 
told told me but dr wood being the head of at that time he's no longer at that time he was the head of the the superintendent of assemblies of god had gotten all these reports especially when said was arrested uh he was told all of this is the, he was told before said's arrest but also be careful don't be too public about said because this is who he is so dr wood knew said's history of abuse and in that that phone call he he divulged that to you he called me and he said nagme can I ask why you came forward with this? He said, because we knew this. He said, and what happened? And I explained how I realized I was an abused wife. And, and his response to me was, I am so glad this came out. Millions could have been deceived. Hmm. And, I, and then that's when I poured out my heart and I said, Dr. Wood, can you please explain to Franklin Graham what you just said? Of, of that you knew of Said's abuse because no one's believing me right now. And Franklin has accused me of adultery. Can you please write a letter? And he said, okay. That letter you've sent to me, and he's very clear in that letter, which again, you forwarded to Franklin, that there were reports of physical and verbal violence against you and your parents, uh, also destruction of property. So that was yes. sent to... To Franklin, and also just that Saeed had also expressed a desire to become rich and famous by writing a book and speaking, which I know mm -hmm. was something you were concerned about as well. So all that yes. did go from Dr. Wood to Franklin Graham. But again, you also got a call from Jay Sekulow. The message I got from ACLJ was now media is on this. We need to have a statement. Uh, there was two concerns. One, what are we going to say to the statement, uh, to the media? Uh, we can say you're on medication and you are mentally ill. And I said, uh, no, I'm actually not on any medication and I'm not mentally ill. I'm actually seeing clearly now what I've been under. And I cannot say that in good conscience, but they, they said, how do we salvage what has happened? And we came up with a statement. I don't remember exactly kind of saying basically what everyone says when they don't want to talk that I've been under a lot of stress and we would appreciate privacy. So something to try to fix the stuff that had come up about Saeed, but I, I, I refused to say I was crazy or I had men mental illness or I was on any form of medication. Jay was on the call or his staff was on the call when they suggested that you say you're mentally ill? It was Jay Seculo and his top uh, advice, advisor, Gene. His last name is, uh, let me see, Gene Cap was the person on the call. So I did reach out to Jay Seculo for a response, specifically asked him whether he urged you to claim you were mentally ill or on medication. His press person responded, the answer to your question is no, we will have no further comment due to attorney-client confidentiality. I also reached out to Franklin Graham for comment, specifically asking him about your conversation. I'll talk more about this statement in, in, in a bit and, and read more portions of it, but um, he did not address that specific allegation that he had asked you about being unfaithful. In mid-November, so right after the emails come out, Christianity Today published a story about your leaked emails. This became really huge news. So now it's not just uh, the insiders knowing about it. Now it's become very, very public. How at that point, when it was published to the world, basically, how did the Christian community respond? Closest people to me started attacking me and calling me, oh, you know, you really, you, it wasn't a leaked email. You really wanted it out there. You were trying to destroy Saeed. You're probably cheating on him. And again, at, at, its, wor at its best, there was silence. At its worst, there was a lot of accusations coming from those who had supported me, who had really been uh, support to me during the last, you know, the three years I advocated for Saeed. Hmm. Well, as you said, January 16th, 2016, Saeed is released from prison in Iran. It takes him a few days. He initially goes to Germany, as I understand it. This is kind of a public relations nightmare in a way for Franklin Graham, because he wants you to show up, as I understand, in Germany with Saeed when he gets off the plane. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. I got a, I got a call from Franklin saying, I'm going to get Greta Van Susteren on the plane. 
we're going to come pick you up on a private jet and take you to Germany so that the reunion, there's the camera captures it, all of that. A big part of me wanted that reunion. So I went to grab my passport, couldn't find it, actually called Congressman, uh, Congressman um, Labrador at that time was Idaho congressman came to my house and he said, are you flying to Germany? And I said, I can't find my passport. I think it's mm. at the, at the bank. Uh, and, and he called the head of the bank, DL Evans. And they said, well, it was like a weekend where the Monday was off, uh, it was something, some holiday. And they said, well, it's on a timer. We can't you, she can't get till to Tuesday. So I told Franklin, can you guys come pick me up on Tuesday, like 10 AM, so I can go to the bank, get the passport, and then we can fly out to Germany. Well, during those the three-day weekend while I was waiting to go get my passport, mm-hmm. I was getting advice saying, this might not be a good idea to get your kids and go to another country because Saeed could do stuff there and you don't have the legal rights you have in America. And so after much counsel, I decided the, the three days I was waiting for my passport, I decided not to go. So by, by Monday night, I messaged Franklin and I said, don't come. I'm not going to go. And in the three days I waited, Said did, I did, when his sister sent me the phone call, phone number, I did call Said, and he was angry. He was, he threatened to come and take the kids back to Iran. He was, he was mad. He said the, you, the, the abuse stuff had, you know, come out. So I, I told Franklin, I'm like, I'm, I'm dealing with a very angry person. I'm not going to go to Germany. Hmm. And, and so, uh, interesting enough later, months later, the passport was actually in my closet. I hadn't found it. <laughs> it was not, but in God's design, huh. I couldn't find it. I thought it was at the bank. So yes, he wanted me to go to Germany, do the story. I didn't. And he was very upset about that. He ended up sending his private jet with some of his security people. And they went to Germany and picked up Said and brought him to America. Hmm. So you didn't do the Germany thing, but several days later, Said came to North Carolina. Uh, again, another opportunity for photo op. Um, and Family as I reunion. understand, yeah. Um, Franklin really wanted you to come to that. Again, you said no. Was there a lot of pressure from him to do that? It was not a firm no. I really wanted to. And then I, I mm-hmm. kept going back and forth, which a lot of abused women do. I, I mm. first I said yes. And then I said, I was really afraid. I knew Said saw me as his enemy. And I, I honestly feared for my life. And I said, I, I first I said, okay. Then I said, only for, because he was going to put us in the same room, romantic, like lights, Wait. candle. <laughs> and wow. I said, separate <laughs> rooms. I need bodyguards. And there has to be counselors there. I'm not just going to talk to Saeed by myself. Um, I made the mistake of asking for marriage counselors. At that time, I didn't realize if you're dealing with an abusive person, marriage counseling is not the answer. And he was really pushing me for to go. He was really, I would say, bullying me to go to North Carolina. It was all over the news that I was going to go to North Carolina. And that was going to be the big photo op opportunity of our family reunion that millions of people were waiting for. And uh, a big snowstorm hit. Franklin was supposed to come get me on Friday and a big store snowstorm hit. And he was, uh, we decided he can have the reunion with his mom and dad and sister and uh, me and the kids could join that Monday. So I said, no, he can have the reunion with his family. We'll join later. During that time, I really prayed and sought the Lord. And I, by God's amazing grace, I, I was, uh, uh, my lawyer, I found a lawyer that said, if you leave Idaho and Said files for anything, a legal separation, divorce, that you will have to stay in North Carolina and fight. Um, and Said had threatened to take the kids to, to back to Iran. And my lawyer said he can do that. He's their father. He has every right. Unless you file for a legal separation in Idaho, then he, he the kids will have to stay here. So I had talked to a lawyer before, you know, going, which helped me make the decision not to go to North Carolina. And Ann Graham Lotz helped me a great deal. One day she called me. And she, we were going back and forth in email, but one, right before I made my final decision, she called me and she said, not me, don't go. There's no cell phone reception. Because I think my last question to her was, is there cell phone reception? And she called me and she said, there's no cell phone reception. You're 50 miles from your closest place to, you can't, you have to run 50 miles to get away. And she said, it's, it's, a, there's a snowstorm there. She's like, you're, it's, it's dangerous for you to go there. So she convinced, she actually confirmed what I already had was coming to that decision not to go. 
Well, and you've released to me some emails, and one of them is from Anne Graham Lotz. You also gave me some emails from Franklin Graham on January 18th. And this is, at this point, he's urging you to come to, again, Asheville, North Carolina, Billy Graham Center retreat there, um, remote place, and to submit to like a week of intensive marriage counseling. And so you write him on January 18th, and you write, because of the tremendous abuse that I've gone through the last 11 years of our marriage, including his time in prison, and including his, being Saeed, call with me yesterday, and his hunger for fame and wanting to work through Zizi to get that fame. Zizi, by the way, is Saeed's sister who works at Liberty University. Uh, And because of Saeed's heart yesterday showing his lack of repentance and his continued vicious cycle of having me beg for his forgiveness and try to fix things and lie to the world that things are not that bad, I need to keep the boundaries that the Lord has clearly spoken for me to keep. This means I will be more happy for Saeed to get counseling by himself. The kids and I will not be part of that process and try to sugarcoat the horrors of the abuse. It is real, and I cannot force myself to back down on my boundaries. Then skipping to the end of your email, you write, the most loving thing that I can do for Saeed is to keep my boundaries and hope for true repentance. Yes. Thank you for your understanding. Franklin responds, Nagme, I'm very sorry for you and Saeed. The Bible is very clear. When we get married, we're to leave mother and father and be joined together and become one flesh. He then confronts you for living with your parents and writes, Even if Saeed was able to prove to you that he has changed and satisfied all of your conditions, I'm afraid that you would raise the bar even higher to make it impossible. He then talks about how a broken home harms children and states, I hope you'll think of them and give reconciliation a chance. God hates divorce. My offer is still good. Then you respond to Franklin, your decision about my character is not accurate. My bar has been very low. I have no intention of divorce. This is not my heart, but I cannot go back under the extreme abuse. I don't have a bar. I don't want abuse anymore. (laughs) Three days later, you get another email from Franklin. In it, he says, you haven't seen Saeed in three years, and you talk about true repentance and reconciliation. How do you know unless you come to see him and spend some time talking with him face to face? I'm counting on you to keep your word as you promised. I'll see you Monday. Then. The following day, Franklin also sends another email. This would be Saturday, I believe. Your husband is a hero. He was jailed for his faith. He has suffered greatly for his faith. He is a hero to millions of people around the world. You did the right thing to make his story known, to try to help him. That is the duty of every spouse. Later in the email, he states, I know many people in the ministry who want money, fame, and to sell their books. I'm not saying that Saeed is not guilty of abuse or watching pornography, and I'm sure he's guilty of much more. The problem is you exposed him publicly to the world and embarrassed him. Oh, no. That's so much worse than the abuse. Uh, Well, apparently. He ends by writing, You want Saeed to crawl to you in Boise where he has been publicly exposed, embarrassed, and shamed. To have your family and friends wag their finger in his face to humiliate and shame him more. I recommend that you come for one week of counseling with him and then make your decision but you need to get away from Boise to be with him quietly where you will be protected. That is my recommendation. He basically wanted my, my support system gone. There's emails where he says you have bad counsel. He, he didn't want me listening to my abuse counselors. He didn't want me listening to pastors and people that knew him, Saeed and were advising against that, um, reuniting in, in a, in a private romantic setting. Uh, He was dismissing my parents, which they were a safe haven for me to run to, um, saying my family was causing the division. Uh, Standard being high, I just didn't want to be beaten and cheated on. That was my standard. And I wanted him to get help on that. And the things I was accused of, there was no understanding. There was no uh, uh, him saying, I'm sorry for the abuse you've endured. Franklin doesn't talk anything, doesn't address any of my deep concerns, and he's just worried about Saeed's reputation. Hmm. To be fair, I want to read Franklin Graham's statement that he sent to the Roy's report when I asked him about his actions relating to you and Saeed. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's very long, but I will post it to my website. 
But he writes, like everyone else who accepted Nagme's pleas for help securing her husband's release from prison and worked to mobilize prayer support and public awareness, I was both shocked and saddened to hear just days before his release of her account of abuse suffered during her marriage, and I continue to try to help this family in any way I possibly could. Certainly, abuse of any kind, physical, emotional, psychological, or spiritual, is wrong and should not be tolerated or excused. While I am not a licensed counselor, I did offer limited counsel to both Nagme and Saeed as a minister. Since then, Nagme has been publicly critical of me and the counsel I may or may not have given her, though she is certainly free to disclose whatever she wishes about her life and her communications with me. I do not believe it would be appropriate for me to publicly disclose or discuss advice or counsel I may have offered to this couple. Other than to say, it was always my sincere desire to see Nagme and Saeed experience biblical reconciliation and a God-given restoration to their marriage. I have not communicated with either Nagme or Saeed for several years and do not intend to discuss the matter further, and certainly not publicly. What's your reaction to that statement? It's a, a misinformation and lie. First of all, my information was not released days leading to Saeed's release. It's, it's, it's a narrative that Franklin and others have painted that I realized Said was coming out and I thought, oh, I'm with someone. How am I going to get away with cheating on Said? Oh, let's call him an abuser and so I can get away with uh, adultery. That's not the case. It came out months before Said get out, got out. It was not days. So that's false. Uh, second, uh, his worry for psychological, emotional abuse. Why hasn't he... Why hasn't he told me that in the six years he, that he's had a chance? So where's the fruit of what he's saying? If I des- if I truly believe emotional abuse, psychological abuse, uh, physical abuse is bad, uh, you would see the fruit of it in my life. You would see that I am advocating for it. Where's the fruit in Franklin's life saying that he stands against abuse? On the mm-hmm. contrary, he has, he has advocated for Saeed uh, when he knew Saeed was an abusive person. And it's my understanding what you are asking for is saying, I'm not going to submit to being alone with my husband or even face to face in a week of counseling in a remote area. What I need to see from my husband is that he's repentant, but he needs to deal with the abuse. He needs to meet with an abuse counselor. And it's interesting. I talked to David Chadwick about this. Again, you're the pastor that you divulged what had been happening to you back in November of 2015. And he said, from his experience, again, he has a doctorate in counseling and and pastoral ministry. He said, absolutely, you have to see that change over time. You do not put an abused wife with her abusive husband in marriage counseling when that husband hasn't shown any repentance and hasn't shown to her that, that he's safe, that she can even be with him. Why would I put myself in a situation where I'm alone in a room with someone who's threatening to harm me and take my children? Hmm. And I, I found stunning the, the part of, of Franklin's letter where he's like, well, lots of people want to get rich on the ministry. <laughs> like, it's okay, because lots of people do it. Yeah, it's okay to be making money off of ministry. What's wrong with that? Ay, ay. And it's my understanding, too, during this time, you actually had been paid in advance to do a story with Saeed about, you know, everything that happened, you paid back what you had been paid, your agent had been paid, what Saeed had paid, you you lost money. You, you paid tens of thousands more mm-hmm. back to get out of that deal because you didn't want to write a lie. Is that correct? So, yes, I sold everything I had and I got out of the deals. And that mm. was one of the reasons Saeed was very upset because he wanted to write a book and be famous. Hmm. Well, good for you. I mean, I've been in that world and Boy, I tell you, it, it just seems like a de- it just seems like a deal with the devil. To be well, honest, well, it's it's not it's, uh, today. I shared something on my social media. It's not Christianity. It's it's it, it's been um, uh, morphed into something I can't even recognize anymore. I work with the underground churches in Iran and Turkey. The pastors laying down their life. They're not celebrities. Uh, you know, it's hard to be a wolf, and a lot of them, you know, are women. Uh, it's hard to be a wolf when, uh, when, uh, you have to give your life. So there's not a lot of wolves, um, you know, but <laughs> kinds of weed, weeds them out, doesn't it? When, when it you kinda, have to lay down your life for, for Christianity, like, for what nah. you, yeah, 
I, the yeah. wolf, being a wolf here is easy because you get a platform, you get money, you get fame, you get a book, you get movie. So you can be a wolf in sheep's clothing here, but in the Middle East where you have to actually die for the sheep and for your faith, a lot of wolves are done. They actually mm. are like, actually, I'm a wolf. I'm done. I'm moving on, <laughs> you know, so it's harder, but it's not Christianity. What we're seeing, the celebrity mm. world of Christianity where pastors are treated like mini gods and mm. they, they demand, they lord it over people. Uh, they abuse the flock financially in, in, in every sense of the word. And they don't lay down their life. They sexually use their their position to sexually abuse, uh, emotionally abuse, financially abuse. This is not Christianity. And how mm. are we going to be a light to the world? And and that's why I wanted to get out. I that was not the Christ. That's not what sent me to Iran to share the gospel. I didn't go mm. to Iran thinking how can I become famous. I had no social media. The first time I started as social media was to advocate for Said. I wasn't even on social media barely before 2012. I didn't care for people to know what I was doing. I actually recently took a break from my ministry because I don't, I don't like talking about what God's doing and rescuing women from abuse and uh, persecution in Iran uh, and trying to make money off of it. It's ministry has become such a dirty word to me, uh, mm. but that this is not Christianity to uh, become celebrities and have the praises of people. So I wanted to untangle myself from the world. That's why I got out of the book deal. I just wanted mm. a quiet life pure life before the Lord. And, you know, I started reaching out to refugees again. No one knows a lot of what I do. No one really knows about. And that's the life I wanted. I wanted a quiet ministry with no one knowing what's happening. Hmm. One really interesting development, which you mentioned, is that while you're corresponding with Franklin, you reached out to Anne Graham Lott's Franklin's sister. And specifically, you told her how scared you were to go Mm -hmm. uh, to North Carolina, but you're also asking for advice. Like, again, you were saying how you, you were kind of waffling, like, <laughs> am I doing the right thing? She responded on January 21st, 2016 in an email she writes, and this is stunning. Your email, I, I love this. This is always how I've ima imagined Anne Graham Lott. She seems like such a godly woman. She is. Your email, beloved Nagme, is an answer to my prayers. I prayed for you throughout the night last night. When I awoke early this morning, I found myself praying for you deep down in my spirit. Then I prayed for you during my devotional time. What you shared below is the right thing to do. I totally confirm that you are to stay in Boise where you have a network of support. You are right. Franklin does not understand. And I also can tell you, Franklin is not a good listener. Just never mind him if that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> As only a sister can say, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, wow. I mean, that must have meant a great deal to you. I mean, I'm sure it means a great deal to you today, but at the time, I'm sure that was just like water in a dry desert. That was my confirmation not to go. That, her telling me, you don't have to go, you don't have to listen. He, she told me on the phone, why do you care about the Graham name? We're all the same. Like, why are you, why are we idols in your life? Why mm. do you have to listen to Franklin? Her confirmation was what basically one of the th reasons my, my, me and my kid's life was saved and we didn't go to North Carolina because she could, hmm. I was asking the Lord for a confirmation and she sent me that email and she called me. Not to be deterred. It sounds like Franklin put Saeed, his counselors, the marriage counselors he wanted you to meet with, Franklin's own bodyguard on a private jet, sent them out yes. to you on January 26th. So this is just five days after Saeed's arrived in the U.S. And from what I understand, you were actually on the phone with like a Reuters reporter. And that's how you found out? Like you didn't get any warning on this. Is that right? So my lawyer said, if he ever comes, you need to file for a legal separation and a protection order so he can't take the kids and take him to Iran. That was my biggest worry because, mm -hmm. you know, he had threatened to do that. Then I get a call in the morning from Reuters saying, how do you feel about Said coming to Boise? And I said, oh, no, he's not. They're like, oh, yes, he <laughs> is. <laughs> I was like, I don't think so. I'm like yeah. arguing with the Reuters reporter. They're like, we confirmed it with the uh, Samaritan's Purse people. His plane, his private jet has just taken off. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I have probably less than four hours because I'd been on that private jet going back and forth. I thought I don't have that much time. So I called my lawyer 
And she said, you need to go. He, he, he cannot take the kids. He, he, she said with a private jet, it's so easy. He just comes, takes them. He, he, he's their father. He can do whatever he wants. He mm-hmm. can take him out of state if he wants to. And who does that? When I've told Franklin, I'm afraid Said has threatened to take the kids. Who does a surprise with a bodyguard and Said and his parents and his sister and the marriage counselors? They show up uh, unannounced on a private jet, like that is traumatic. And so I, I got it. And that's what the media didn't understand. Why did I, all of a sudden I get a protection order. So he can't take the kids. I told, you know, the court gave me that because I'd explained the threats, Said's threats and anger towards me and wanting to take the kids. And then I had to le- file for a legal separation. So the kids had to stay in Idaho. He couldn't take them legally. So that's why I didn't want to divorce Said. I just wanted protection until Said got help. As I pull in, I'm talking to my pastor on the phone and I see as I am literally just pulling into the uh, parking lot, I see another car parked come beside me and it's Franklin Graham's bodyguard, Tim. And next to him is sitting Said. Said is sitting next to him. And I look in the backseat is his mom and his dad and his sister. And then I see another car behind them that I don't recognize who were the marriage counselors. And I just, I'm beside myself and I run out. I, uh, I just, I st- stress out. And my pastor says, hand the phone over to Saeed. I'm going to explain to him. He can't come and take the kids. So I give the phone to Saeed. I look at the bodyguard and I say, you know, there's a protection order. Uh, and Saeed cannot take the kids because that was my number one worry. He was going to take the kids and, uh, and, and I found out as I was talking to the bodyguard, I was like, when are you guys planning to leave? Oh, we were planning to leave tomorrow. Now we got to get a hotel. And I was like, whoa, uh, because they realized that this was going to be a longer process. And so they were, they were anticipating they could take the kids back. Yep. They weren't anticipating and staying in Boise because from what Tim told me, he's, he's like, well, now I guess we got to stay long. And I, ha- he's like, I need to go back tomorrow. He said, I need to go back tomorrow, but I guess the marriage counselors, and that's how I realized it was marriage counselors. He said, I guess they have to stay. Uh, from what he told me, I was shocked that they weren't even, they, they, their plan wasn't to come and stay in Boise. Their plan was to come and get you. they didn't get you, get me, get me and the kids or just the kids. I don't know. And so I wow. told him that I said, uh, say, can not take the kids. Uh, he has supervised visits in the next few days. He can spend as much time as he wants. I basically told the judge that Said can have every single day with the kids, uh, except for overnights. Uh, and because he hasn't seen the kids, you know, Mm -hmm. um, so he did, he had them that for every single day until we had a, we had a court hearing, but I was just shocked that I was given a surprise visit on a private jet, knowing that Said had threatened to take the kids. Mm -hmm. And it was very traumatic. It was very, very scary to do that. And then that's when the reunion happened. The kids came out, saw him in the parking lot. And there was photos that was released by the Idaho statement the next day showing the kids reunited with their father. Hmm. Wow. So for the next several months, there's a lot going on behind the scenes with you, Franklin, Saeed. And in the middle of all this, I was stunned to find this uh, out on the internet. Uh, In March 2016, the video is still out there. Saeed suddenly appears at a convocation at Liberty University in front of thousands of students. A- again, his sister Zizi works at Liberty, uh, apparently, and David Nasser, who was the VP of, I don't know, spiritual life, um, basically the chaplain there at Liberty, he's Iranian-American. Um, he talks about it uh, from the stage, how... Zizi had reached out to him, and Saeed's apparently having a little family reunion there in Lynchburg, Virginia. And so, wow, let's let's have him speak in at convocation here at Liberty University. So they actually have this pre-produced. I mean, it's supposedly it just sort of happened, but you know, overnight they produced a uh, promo video uh-huh. that actually opens with you advocating for him. So here you're talking about abuse. It's become public. Um, and they're showing a video opening with you basically lionizing your husband, making him look like a hero. Um, they have this entire video that, uh, they play. And then, uh, David Nasser uh, begins to interview 
um, Saeed and asks him about his time in Iran, his experience, the persecuted church. Then at the very end, and I'm going to play a clip, uh, David Nasser asks him about the troubles in his marriage. I'm going to play a, a clip that gives Saeed's response and then also what Nasser says, and then I, I would love your response to what you hear. So I'm the same as other people. The last part of my story was the hardest. Still, I got free from prison, but to be honest with you, still I couldn't feel my freedom yet because of the new battle that I went through. Uh, I had, you know, different imagination when I'm going to be free, how it's going to be. But now I'm just seeing that the things that are in my life, it's not in good position actually, especially in my marriage. But I believe God's in it. God is in the middle and in the bottom of everything in our life. And we need just to trust and keep fighting and don't give up and uh, stay under any pressure and we're going to see that he's going to be glorified. Amen. Man, we are uh, heavy hearted for what's happening right now with uh, your marriage. And I know that, um, that there is great hope in knowing that you're not staying, that you're not alone in this. You know, from Pastor Franklin Graham to other uh, just brothers and sisters in Christ, there's an army of people who are standing with you, fighting with you, praying with you. An army of people. Saeed's got an army. Interesting he mentions Franklin Graham. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did you hear that at the time when it happened? I, 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 do, I don't remember it. I remember just feeling sick to my stomach when he got that Fox News interview. And then he got the, he, I knew he was at Liberty. I just couldn't listen to it. And then he spoke at an event at a church where Mark Driscoll prayed for him. All the victims, all the abuse, <laughs> abusers wow. who, who acted like victims. <laughs> Uh, hmm. they all felt sorry for him and, oh, you know, he was really shocked. He wanted to come to out of prison as a hero. He wanted to be worshiped like most abusive pastors do. And he wanted to make a lot of money. None of that happened. What's your impression though, of David Nasser, the, the way that he presented Saeed, the way that he responds when Saeed talks about the troubles, but God's going to be glorified. There's no mention of the abuse. There's no uh, addressing it. There's no concern. They obviously gave him a platform and it's all about poor Saeed and we're with you. Is there any, I mean, there were a lot of people were with me when I was advocating for his release. Is there anyone with me uh, when I'm saying that I'm in danger and he's abusive? It's just one-sided and it, that's how it was. It was one-sided of poor you. I mean, I think a lot of religious Leaders who are abusive were shaken, thinking, oh, no, uh, you know, this. Uh, the interesting thing with my case that I believe God has given me a platform is I had become somewhat of a hero, too. So Saeed didn't have that. Usually it's the, the pastor, uh, the person who's famous. They mm -hmm. can easily silence the wife. And because I'd been given a platform, Saeed didn't have as much of a weight, even though Franklin was on his side you know, Liberty gave him a platform. Uh, there was still, uh, I was the one advocating for him. So there was, in, in a sense, what I, I had, what most women don't have. I had, I, I was given some, what of a voice and a platform. Uh, and that's why Saeed uh, didn't get as big as he wanted to. About a month after this Liberty convocation, you sent an email to Franklin Graham Apparently, you had met separately with his counselors, Dan Stevens and his wife, correct? Yes. And you inform him that the Stevens agreed with you that Saeed should get abuse counseling before you ever submit to any marriage counseling. Franklin Graham replies, and I quote, I have waited to respond. I know that you wouldn't want to hear what I have to say. However, it is important that I be very honest with you. The only hope for you and your children is for you and Saeed to reconcile. You have made many demands since Saeed got out of prison. I think both of you need to see a counselor together. If you continue this way, you and Saeed will destroy your children. Your children need you and they need their father. They need both of you. They need the both of you to be together as one. I'm willing to help both of you, but only the two of you together. I told Franklin, Said has severe PTSD and paranoia. I am his enemy. He wants to destroy me. And he laughed at me. 
And to, to know all of that and to still say it's on me that my family's getting destroyed, to know all the fear, all the things, and to have it confirmed by pastors. Most women don't have that. They don't have pastors saying, yes, she's right. We're behind. I had that. I had pastors saying, we confirm Saeed's pastors, my pastors. I had many people. And still Franklin says, it's my fault that I don't want to get alone in a room with Saeed and do marriage counseling. And, and my standard is too high for wanting no more abuse in my marriage. And it was really getting to me. It was those words of Franklin Graham were really, really affecting me. I can look back at it now and, you know, um, see how silly it was. But at that time, I was really considering what Franklin Graham was telling me. So about the same time that all of this is happening, Christianity Today publishes an interview with Saeed. In that interview, Saeed argues that your accusations are false, that he never abused anyone in his life. He's never been addicted to anything at all. Um, question, did Christianity Today, did they reach out to you for your side of the story on this? No. If you read it, they never said we reached out to Nagme and Nagme had to say this. Uh, there was my, the stuff that came out about the abuse, they talk about that and then Said answers it. Nothing about, n- no reaching out to me about Said's comments. Or I, it, when mm. it came out, I saw it. I didn't even know it was coming out. And how'd you feel when you read that? I just felt I was being kicked again and again and again. And Said was given a platform and I was, everything was trying to discredit me um, and give Saeed a voice. I should mention, I did reach out to Saeed to hear his side of the story. Um, Initially, he said, yes, I had to reschedule um, because something came up. And then he he was not interested in talking to me anymore. (laughs) So I don't know um, what exactly happened there, but he just stop communicating. So, but I, I did make the effort, um, and we'll continue to, uh, if, if he wants to make a statement or, or say something, um, that's always my practice to reach out to all sides involved. So Mm -hmm. that's what I did. Um, this whole time, uh, again, spring 2016, um, Saeed is in Boise. Is that right? Where you and the kids are? Yeah. And so majority of 2016, Said was in Boise and we were going through our legal battle. Okay. So, so then beginning of the summer, Said heads out to Alaska and works for Franklin Graham for the balance of the summer, I believe. At the end of that time, Franklin requests, did he request a face-to-face meeting with you? Is that how that happened? In August of 2016, I get a lot of calls from Franklin and I'm, my body's shaking. What's going on? I listen to the message and it says, knock me. I want to meet with you. And Saeed has confessed to some things and, uh, he, he wants to make this relationship work. I'm shocked because up to this point, I'm the liar and Saeed, there has been no confession from Saeed. And then I didn't answer. I called my abuse counselor. He said, write Franklin Graham and say, Franklin, I have nothing to do with you. I don't want to meet with you. Uh, I, I refuse to meet with you, something like that. Uh, it was really hard for me to do that, but I realized why my counselor helped me come up with that short email is because Franklin still had a hold in my life and I had to break that idolatry and for the first time say no, mm-hmm. like, I don't want to meet with you. And then after I said that to Franklin, I get a lot of calls and messages from Saeed. I want to work on our marriage. Can we meet? And um and at that time, I was afraid to say no, because I thought they're going to say in media that Saeed tried to make the marriage work, but Nagme didn't even want to meet. So I said, okay. I talked to my a counselor again, abuse counselor, and he said, make sure uh, you bring, if you meet with Saeed, bring two witnesses and record it, record the meeting. So I sent that over to Saeed. I said, okay, I can meet, but I need, I'm going to bring my pa- pastor and my lawyer, and I'm going to be recording the meeting because I was afraid that they were going to somehow Franklin, I didn't know Franklin was going to be in that meeting. Cause at that time I told Franklin, I don't want to meet with you. And then Said and his text uh, mentioned that Franklin wants to be in the meeting. And I said, he wanted me to change the schedule. So Franklin could come. And I said, Franklin doesn't need to be in the meeting. It's me and you. And so in, in trying to save himself and have a ministry of his own, he confessed to Franklin. A lot of things that I had said was true. And that's why Franklin and Said reached out to me. 
uh, they wanted to meet with me. And according to both of them, Said had confessed some things to Franklin and he really wanted to try to work on the marriage. So I, I decided to meet with them. I have several clips. Again, you met in Boise at a conference room at a hotel there and you did record it and you've given me that recording. Um, he, here's the first one. This is from the beginning of the meeting, kind of Franklin um, giving a preamble to sort of set the stage for uh, how the meeting's going to go. So in this, he vouches for Saeed's character. I'd like to play it and then hear your response. I have not found Saeed to, to lie to me. I have asked him questions that he did not answer. And that's his business, not to answer. But, uh, but I found everything that he has said to me has been true uh, when I've asked him a question and he's answered so. Uh, and I think not made for both of you. Um, that this can be fixed, not made, and it can be fixed easy uh, if you want to fix. And I know Saeed has come to that place in his life where uh, he is willing to do whatever it needs to be to fix uh, the marriage uh, for the sake of the children. It's not about his happiness or your happiness, not me. It's about your children and their happiness and their life together. I'm not a marriage counselor. Me, okay, that's not what I do. I wouldn't do that for all the tea in China, I promise you. I don't have a gift at this. But I want to see this marriage. Um, I'd like to see this marriage if it's God's will to survive. So it sounds like to me, um, Saeed's being honest. He wants the marriage to work. Nagme, you got to change. Exactly. Actually, in the meeting, Franklin calls me the liar because I didn't tell him that Said was on the was communicating with me via phone from prison. So I am the liar, untrustworthy person who's destroying the family, and Said is the trustworthy person who's trying to do everything to save the marriage for the sake of the children. All along, I've told Franklin, I'm afraid for my life. I'm afraid for my kid's life. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And it's on me to save the marriage when all I've asked is no more abuse. Past is forgiven, mm -hmm. no more abuse. I will not divorce you. We we can still work this out, but just no more abuse. That's my standard. There are two other clips from that meeting that I want to play. And in this next one, Franklin appears to downplay emotional and psychological abuse that you've endured. Of course, at this point, he knows about the physical abuse, but you know, perhaps he thinks Franklin's or perhaps he thinks Saeed's changed. But it's clear that. Franklin does not believe that abuse counseling is necessary. He also seems surprised when you mention that Saeed may have PTSD. And there's a story in here, and it's easy to miss, so I'm just kind of giving people a heads up. Franklin tells a story that's I'm, kind of shocking um, about a marriage that he supposedly saved, yet in the same breath he says that the husband was just killed a couple of weeks ago in an altercation with police. So you have to wonder, how safe was this wife in this marriage? that was supposedly saved, but take a listen, judge for yourself. In discussing this abuse counseling and the counseling business, this is something Magme, that is kind of a gray area because all marriage counseling, or counselors deal with abuse. Because in, in most marriages, counseling, abuse is where a husband comes home and he drinks a six pack of beer and after he's had his six beer, he jumps up out of the chair because the kids are making noise and he beats his wife and beats the kids, and that's that's something that goes on almost every day. And so you, these marriage counselors are dealing with abuse. All of them are dealing with abuse. And uh, But to have a counselor who specifically is designated as an abuse counselor, that is something that nobody really knows of or hasn't really occurred. The outside world has come to, I sent some articles to the counselors. The outside world has knows, I guess, is wiser than the children of God. They know that there's no way you can solve an abusive relationship with marriage counseling. The abuse has to be dealt with first. And if you look at any, you said you're not a counselor, you're not marriage counselor. If you look at any Christian um, counseling, they say never do marriage counseling in, in, when there's a case of abuse. Okay, but, and, but, but you're talking about a relationship where the wife comes home every night and she's being beaten. And she's being stomped on. You know, our def they, these are the types of situations, and that's not what you've been facing. Your husband has been in prison. I was beaten. 
your husband has been in prison for three and a half years, mm -hmm. and he's not the same person that went into prison. He's going to be more dangerous. He might have PTSD. He might. I've had military wives talk to me who say, I have military wives. PTSD. Who, yeah. Post traumatic syndrome. Mm -hmm. So you think he's got that? He's been in a prison. He's, he was abusive when he was, he was before prison. Okay. He was verbally and emotionally abusive in prison. And he was three and a half years in a prison. Should he not? I've had military wives contact me and say, I wish we, there was a transition time. Our husbands get handed over to us, and it's help. And we don't know well, what to do well, with it. This is, this is what I do every week. I have military couples, mm -hmm. marriage counseling that we do. I'm doing it right now in Alaska. And they, these are couples that have, that have not only brain injuries, I'm talking about serious brain injuries. I'm talking about guys who are missing legs, limbs, mm -hmm. eyes, had burns. Uh, marriages that... Uh, are, are coming to the point of where they're wanting to divorce. And uh, I had a couple of couples come to me today in, up in Montana that were with me last year. One of them, husband, was shot by the police a few weeks ago and got some kind of altercation and, he, and, and the police shot him and so his wife came to me just crying today, putting her arms around her, but thanking me for helping to save their marriage, which is unfortunate that the fact that uh, the husband got into this this mm -hmm. altercation with the cops, and another man, a black man, whose marriage was was finished. He said, "Thank you for helping to save my marriage." He said, "My marriage wouldn't be there." I deal with these combat veterans every day. So, mm -hmm. Okay, not me. I'm just here. Listen, you can you can read all the articles you want. You can, no, it's just you can, scripture. Okay, okay, but listen, you. It takes two people to make it work. If you want to make this work, you're going to have to move a little bit, okay? Somebody's not an abuse. To I'm bit. sorry, but in abuse... Don't tell me you're sorry because it doesn't matter to me. It's not yeah. me. Really I'm sorry, don't. Saeed, but the abuse has to be dealt with. I can't... I, you know, you know more than anyone how much I loved you. You told... You always said it was astonished. The whole family was amazed how much I love you. I know the three and a half years I gave my life to you. I know what I did. Does that evoke strong emotion when you you hear this conversation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was at the end of myself. I had no energy. I was in the middle of a, trying to protect me and the kids, and I still wanted the marriage to work. I didn't see divorce coming. A divorce happened soon after that side filed, but... It's shocking that Franklin basically says abuse is if a man gets drunk every night and beats his wife. If, if you listen to the recording, he's basically saying that's not safe. Abuse is if someone's drinking and getting drunk every night and beating his wife every night. That's abuse. That's what we deal with. Uh, and then uh, to say that he saved a marriage, but then the husband had altercations with the police. I mean, how safe was you're happy that you saved a marriage that could have potentially cost the wife her life? Uh, and for him to not think Said had PTSD, where it's obvious he had PTSD and he works, he works with military. He, they do the, uh, they do a ministry in Alaska to serve military. And are they dismissing the cries of the woman who are saying uh, he has PTSD and abuse? Franklin can't see it. And what are the advice they're giving these families? And for him to say Saeed doesn't have it, and then for later for have the court's uh, psychologist to come out publicly and say Saeed has severe PTSD and paranoia. And then for him to say it's on me for the marriage to work when all I've asked for is to deal with the abuse. I mean, Franklin, it's obvious that this is so different than the statement he gave in, his, in the message we just heard his own voice, he dismisses every other form of abuse. He thinks abuse is a man getting drunk every night and beating his wife every night. And, and even then I said, I was physically abused. And, and, and still then he says, it's on you to save the marriage. Still, he's giving bad advice. Well, he doesn't even skip a beat when you say I was abused. No, he just, I mean, it, it sounds like he has an agenda and no matter what you say, it just seems to move the conversation just seems to move in the direction that he wants exactly. it to go. Exactly. At one point, though, that it gets kind of heated. Um, a, a couple of times he does accuse you of lying. As you said, he accuses you of lying because you didn't tell him about your communication with Saeed, which, again, uh, Jay Seculo had told you don't do that mm -hmm. because that could get Saeed in a lot of trouble. Um, 
But secondly, Franklin confronts you because you said your pastor, Bob Caldwell, knew everything about the abuse. And in this clip, Pastor Caldwell responds to that. And the two of them kind of go head to head, but I think this is pretty telling. Be careful, okay? Because you don't know what you don't know. No, all so, I'm no, saying. No, wait, don't interrupt me. No, I'm saying. I know you're a big no, shot. I'm saying what she don't, told me. Don't interrupt no, me. No, she, what she told me. Do I have a right to talk? Do I have a right to talk? You go right ahead. I'd appreciate it because you said something about me and I'd like to respond. Okay. I appreciate it. From my observation of her statement that I know everything, I knew nothing about the imprisonment stuff. Zero. Okay? The imprisonment Be- stuff. He, while she, when he was in prison. The things that I know all about is I know him better than anyone else. Okay. And I know the history better than anyone okay. else. And so in my life with her and with you, I know him in a way that nobody else knows him. Okay. That's all. I know everything. I know her weaknesses. I've seen her weaknesses. But, but, but I've why seen his weaknesses. To me? Because I believed he's in prison and I believed that her advocacy for him was the only thing that was going on now. She didn't tell me anything about him cussing her out. She didn't tell me anything. But you knew about the pornography. I didn't know about any of that. The, the pornography was nothing not... Nothing about the, the prison. That, nothing, that, none of that came out until she... November 1st, I told said you. it all to everybody. I didn't know that stuff. And I, she was doing... I, will, I myself she, told him. Yes. No, you called me after she oh, told everyone. He had, then you called me on the phone. Okay, but From listen, prison. Right, okay, so don't Bob, back it up. Bob, yeah. First of all, I apologize... If I was anyway, because I was under the impression that you knew everything, and I'm thinking to myself, if you knew everything, mm-hmm. why didn't you warn me about yeah. well, this I situation? knew everything about these guys. That's all. Okay. okay. But, so, but it's an example of something that um, I just think, you know, in a sense, we're all equal in this room right now. Okay, we are all facing a, a crisis. You want it fixed. She wants it fixed. I want it fixed. He says he wants it fixed. These guys are watching. So I've watched them fight. I've watched the interaction. I've watched the verbiage. And the things that have happened that she said in November were, were similar to the things, the conflicts that they had before, okay? And so when he got out, the, the behavior, the things that she can prove by showing you you know, things he said up till, let's say, three or four weeks ago, there's a similar dynamic. So that she does not want a divorce, and she has a simple request. I want to feel safe psychologically. May, you've never been around, obviously, psychological abuse, because if you have, it is worse by far sometimes than any physical abuse. That's not how we deal with this, I understand Well, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. No, I know you're serious, then, I understand Then it. let's respect it, because- well, I'm not disrespecting But you were saying that her weakness in this situation is, she's not getting beat up, so therefore it's not real abuse, it's uh, it's kind of mental abuse that can be dealt with by talking it over. And, and, and trying moving. to find a counselor. Wow, again, He's talking, Bob Caldwell's talking about the abuse, the, the emotional abuse, the psychological abuse. Franklin's saying, I, I, I get that. And yet at the same time, but I'm, I'm talking about we just need to get into some marriage counseling, he says at the end. At the end of this meeting, did you feel like Franklin understood or did you feel like it was just more of the same? It's the same. As uh, Anne Graham Lott said in her email, he doesn't listen. And he doesn't want to listen. He wanted a saved marriage. And that's the cycle he kept going through for the 2016. You just, it's your fault. You need to make the marriage work. Go to marriage counseling. And um, no regard for my safety, my fear, my concerns, uh, my pastor speaking out. Um, No understanding of psychological, emotional, or any other form of abuse. He just keeps going back to marriage counseling. Does this make you concerned for, again, he's talking about, Franklin Graham's talking about, he does this all the time. They have an entire ministry, they have a ministry to military. Military who have gone through PTSD, who many women have reached out to me from our military saying I'm being abused. Um, 
And this really concerns me that he is ad- advising um, anyone on any any form of marriage or abuse. Uh, it's concerning he has a ministry that does that in Alaska. It concerns me that he is a f- religious figure that people look to and have him speak at events when his view on abuse is so horrific, is so unbiblical. It should uh, just shock every person that someone who is uh, proclaiming to be a follower of Christ, to be a leader, is has this kind of a view on abuse. Wow. And, and I have to say, before I started reporting on this, I never, never would have dreamed it's this bad. Yes. I, Grew up, I grew up in a home where my mother was respected and she was treated with dignity and respect. I'm in a home where my husband mm. treats me that way. He's never lifted a hand to me. I had no idea how rampant abuse was. Again, that's physical abuse. I, I, I've, I've never been subjected to emotional, psychological abuse either. And yet, you know, it's, it's just rampant. I talked woman after woman. And so I'm, I'm so glad that you're speaking out about this. I'm, I would have never guessed either the callousness on the part of men and the and men who are Christian leaders who I thought cared about women, I thought loved women. Obviously, we haven't learned as a Christian community. I, I'm hoping after the Me Too movement, the Church Too movement, now you coming out and speaking, women are finding their voice. There's no doubt that women are finding their voice within the church. Would you just speak, though, to to other women who are in the same situation that you were in, and I know you have an organization, uh, it's called TAF for short. I'm not going to try to, can you pronounce it for me so I don't massacre how it's pronounced? Yes, it's on hold right now. It's Tahrir Al-Nisa Foundation. Tahrir means uh, freedom, and Al-Nisa in Arabic means woman. So freedom for women foundation. Okay. It comes from, uh, if, if, if the, the truth has set you free, you're free indeed. So setting women free through, uh, God's through God's uh, amazing rescue that he rescued me. Mm. Uh, when, it, but you say it's on hold right now. Yeah. I I've struggled with having a ministry. I started it in order to help persecuted women, but, uh, again, ministry is such a, I'm sorry to mm. say it has become such a curse word for me. I want to help women without having a name, a ministry. So I, we put it on hold praying through, I'm, I'm still ministering to women. I'm just, there's just, uh, the ministry's on hold. We don't receive donations and, um, we do videos once in a while. Uh, there's just something about money and ministry that has really, uh, traumatized me. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would say what, when Saeed's story got really big, it was woman. That made it big. Majority of people that shared on social media and called Congress and senators were women. The majority of people that did prayer vigils were women. Majority of people that orchestrated for me to speak at churches were women. And now as women, we have a voice. We can wait. You know, our leaders were forced to do something to get the Americans out of Iran because all of us women spoke out. There was a few men, but majority were women. And it became a movement. As women we have a voice to speak out for each other. We were waiting. I was, I wanted the religious leaders to speak out. I wanted uh, for someone, there's just a bond between them. There's loyalty and it's hard for when one falls for others to say, you know, speak out or protect the sheep. It's rare. So I want to say as women, we do have a voice. I found my voice and each of us have a voice. And this voice as, as Julie's voice is so crucial as your voice is so crucial, Julie, our voice can make a change. I saw that with Saeed. There was a prayer movement. Millions were praying. Thousands of cities were praying across the world for the persecuted church to get Saeed out. And I believe there can be a movement to say no more. We are no longer going to idolize. We're going to break down like in the Old Testament. Godly king came and he tore down the idols. Let's tear down the idol, the idolatry of celebrity pastors and worship leaders and those we put Uh, you know, we worship and we say, don't you dare say anything negative about them. Let's tear them down and say, you're accountable. You should be above reproach. And if someone comes out about abuse, let's investigate. You should be the one, not the victim should not be the one to try to prove it. You should be the one that the proof of evidence should be on you to try to say, to clear your name. Let's believe the victims. And as women, we can raise our voice and be that change. Unfortunately, those who 
are supposed to be that voice have not been that voice. They've been quiet, maybe because they struggle with the same things, maybe because they they have abuse also. Uh, I don't know, but there's been silence from those who should be defending the flock, pastors, leaders, elders. And unfortunately, the sheep have to start sp- defending each other. And, and we can. I, I just ask every woman to be a voice, speak out, keep uh, people like Franklin and others accountable for their view on abuse, for the bullying to return to an abusive marriage, to the danger that's causing to the woman and children. And I believe our individual voices can bring a change and health to the church. It can be a safe place. It can be a light that brings in many, many uh, broken women. Amen. And I, I said it in talk I gave at the Restore Conference we had in 2019, but it, it's true. It's Each of us has that one smooth stone, right? Just like David had to slay a Goliath. We have a Goliath of corruption and abuse in this church. That is so interesting. In God's church. So interesting you said that because Hmm. uh, I was thinking of that. You know, David had experienced previous battle. Today, I kept thinking Goliath, Goliath, before my my interview with you, (laughs) God kept telling me Goliath, reminding me of David had experienced previous battles, so he was able to face the Goliath and say, who are you to stand before the living God? God has had given me experience being bullied by a uh, radical uh, Islamic government to deny my faith in Iran. Then when I was advocating for sight, I had the Iranian government breathing down my neck saying, be quiet, don't say anything. And I was threatened to be quiet by them. And that was preparing me to speak, unfortunately, to bullies within the church. And uh, the Goliath of corruption of hiding abuse, of all forms of abuse, um, will come down. We are his daughters. We are his bride. God does not tolerate his bride and his bride, his church, and his daughters being treated like this. And this is his battle. And, you know, we say to that, to the Goliath of corruption and abuse, who are you to do this to the church of God? And he will come down. And it requires each of our stones and each of our voices, as you said. Amen. And, and God is is for us. It needs women coming forward, but men, you're not off the hook either. We need men stepping up, truly being men of God, truly fighting, just like Jesus did for the oppressed. And and like you said, throughout the Old Testament, you see the prophets calling out the kings because they didn't care Mm -hmm. about the oppressed. And so this is God's heart. Nagme, thank you so much um, for taking this time, for telling your story, for your obedience to Christ, for your integrity. Uh, It is just an, an honor to get to know you and to tell your story. Thank you. And it's all by his strength and by his grace that me and you, I know Julie can do this. It's it's really him. So we give him all the glory and may this be used to bring glory to his name and to bring health back to his church. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Thank you for Amen. having me. And thanks so much for listening to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Royce. If you'd like to connect with me online or see some of the documents that I referenced today, just go to julieroyce, spelled R-O-Y-S dot com. That's julieroyce dot com. Also, just a quick reminder, if you subscribe to The Roy's Report on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, and we just got on Spotify, that's a great way that you can be sure to never miss one of these episodes. And we do appreciate it if you help us spread the word. We've got a mission that we're trying to accomplish here of rooting out corruption and abuse in the church. And you can be a part of that simply by sharing this important content and helping inform the Christian community. So again, thank you so much for listening. Please use what you've learned today to lobby for change. Hope you have a great day and God bless.